We read him in his first struggles as though that's where he was all of his life, and that's where we all have to be. What was this self-hatred? I hate myself. I despise myself. And I was reading him one day, and I said, let me tell you something, Paul. I'm almost 65 years old. It took me my whole life to learn to love myself properly. I'm telling you straight out, I don't care what you said. I'm not buying into self-hatred no matter what. It is not going to happen to me. Self-hatred is contagious. It is vile, and it is problematic. Come on now. Because when you self-hate, you have to find somebody less than you for you to feel good about yourself. I said, nope, Paul, if you had been a member of my church, I would have sent you for counsel. Someone else is going to inter introduce her in a minute, so I'm going to resist that. <laughs> but I want to say a huge thank you to you, Bishop Plunder, for being here. And not just be being here, but being here. And I want to say a huge thank you to the Lowell Institute, who is supporting this lecture, and to the Association of Black Seminarians who have planned this day in collaboration with other offices here at the School of Theology. What better way to do the Lowell Lecture than to have guidance and leadership from the Association of Black Seminarians? Thank you to all, and B. Uh, in an 1892 essay called The Gain from a Belief, Anna Julia Cooper, a black woman educator, intellectual, orator, writer, and black liberation activist prominent in the 19th century declared, quote, religion must be life made true. And life is action, life is growth, life is development, begun now and ending never. And a life made true cannot confine itself. It must reach out and twine around every pulsing interest within reach of its uplifting tendrils. It is appropriate that I mention Cooper's statement that belief is about a life made true today for our Lowell Lecture as we have the privilege of encountering, listening to, learning from, and being challenged by a life made true in Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder. I have to read your bio for those who are streaming and then I'll say a personal note. Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder, a San Francisco native, has served her call through pro prophetic action and ministry for justice for over 30 years. This call to blend proclamation, worship, service, and advocacy on behalf of those most marginalized in church and in society led to the founding of the City of Refuge United Church of Christ in 1991. In 2003, Reverend Dr. Flunder was consecrated presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries, a multi-denominational coalition of over 100 primarily African-American Christian le leaders and laity. Reverend Dr. Flunder is on the board of Star King School for the Ministry and Demos and has taught at many theological schools. She is a graduate of the Certificate of Ministry and Master of Arts program at PSR and received her Doctor of Ministry from San Francisco Theological Seminary. She is also an award-winning gospel music artist and author of Where the, Ed Where the Edge Gathers, a theolo theology of homiletic and radical inclusion. On a personal note, I only recently met Bishop Flunder in person, actually, right when I, it became public that I was coming here to STH. We were both presenting at the Festival of Homiletics in DC in 2018, and we ended up in space together. While she may not have known me, I knew Bishop Flunder. 
for she has been a spiritual companion and voice for me long before we met in 2018 face to face. When I was in graduate school, in many of your positions, in my divinity, in my divinity programs and in my doctorate program in Atlanta, I would go to every church and venue I could go to whenever Bishop Flunder was in town. So I would sit among the people as one of many ready to be challenged, ready, ready to be guided, ready to be reminded of the creative power and calling that was in me. And when she wasn't in town, and I found myself alone in the library carol wondering why God me, I would look for her on YouTube. <laughs> and I could find her. I needed her embodiment. I needed her witness. I needed her proclamation to encourage me in my studies and my vocational work and to remind me that God had not forgotten me. STH, we are blessed this evening to hear from a preacher, an activist, and, lit and living embodiment of our faith manifested in what Cooper calls a life made true. Won't you receive and hear the words of Bishop Flunder this evening? It is a joy to be with family tonight. I have, I have uh, had a great, great day. Wonderful, pithy, powerful conversations. We have talked about some stuff. We've got a chance to worship together. We've got a chance to sing together. We've had an opportunity to have meals together. That's about as close to home as I can describe. I have uh, felt an authentic welcome. I know the difference. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I have honestly felt an, uh, an authentic welcome. I've been cared for beautifully, and I appreciate it so much. I'll have to find a real good reason, Dean, to come back. We'll have to have a chat and have an opportunity to share. Um, I have uh, been working for a number of years to talk about, um, I can lift this just a bit, to talk about addressing and having conversation about co-creating the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God on earth, and our obligation and responsibility to do that. I first had to address what our eschatology taught us. I'm a, a Pentecostal in recovery to some degree. And I say that not because I have an abundant bunch of issues with being a Pentecostal. I, am, I claim and declare that I am a Pentecostal. But I'm in recovery from a few things, one of which was a very burdened eschatology. We spent most of our time getting ready for Jesus to come. A lot of us did not vote. We did not spend a great deal of time uh, doing justice work in the earth. For all intents and purposes, we were just waiting any day, at least by Friday of this week. <laughs> Jesus will be coming back. And all of our work was very insular, a fundamentalist from the standpoint of feeling that other people who were not as concerned as we were about the second coming somehow had missed God. We were a part of the black arm of that, different from the more white arm of that, where the movies were being done, Satan is Alive and Well, Planet Earth, and the late great Planet Earth, and you all know the series. You've seen the apocalyptic series. In the, this was during a rapture season, rapture, rapture time. So we knew that there was a predominantly white concept about it, but then there was a predominantly black concept about it. And the predominantly black concept included the fact that a lot of white people weren't going to make it either because of some of the things they had done <laughs> to us. And so <laughs> the, <laughs> the rapture was the great equalizer. <laughs> Can't do anything about you on earth, but honey, I'm telling you that Jesus is coming back, and boy, is he pissed. That was the basic concept for what it, and so, and so dealing with the eschatology that was associated with that and the underpinning of that eschatology, which was to give 
power and credence to a people who often felt defeated and often felt oppressed that God was going to be the great equalizer in the apocalypse was, was in so many ways the way I was born and raised. That was the environment. So I've done some work around that, and I'll say more um, at, when I'm blessed to come back. But I wanted to use this as a preface for some of the other areas where I've also had to do some reconciling in my spirit and my theology. And this was even before I started going through theological education and before I d decided to work toward degrees of any of that, I had an unsettling in my spirit. And it began there. And then it moved to conversations about oppressive theologies and trying to reconcile oppressive theologies that uh, one sin will put you out theology and how important it was to find God the liberator and to become engaged and involved in active liberation theologies meant that we had to understand our role and responsibility to do the work to get to the places of freedom, to do justice work. And let me just say that within me has always been a concomitant stream. There is within me the culture of the Pentecostal church, the Methabaptocostal church, the sort of southern brand of Pentecostal church. I think you understand me. And there's also the stream of, of justice warrior and the responsibility that we have to encourage the kingdom of God to come on earth as it is in heaven. That we need to spend less time trying to go and trying to see if we can fix <laughs> what it is that we are given, our assignment essentially that's given from the divine. But inside of me, there's always been these concomitant streams. There's a stream that that say my UCC self or my justice self or my poor people's campaign self thinks that my Pentecostal self needs to get a clue as to what time it is. My Pentecostal self thinks that my justice self needs to be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. If you understand it, ask somebody, they'll, they'll share it with you. And they have not left altogether. But my truth is when they converge, Hallelujah. I had a moment there. I had a Pentecostal moment. It'll come back. <laughs> when they converge, something powerful happens. Something powerful. It, um, being a spirit-filled justice warrior is, is a, a wonderful and incredible reality because then it makes us revisit some of the realities that we have experienced and seek to change them. And so I wanted to take a deep dive when I got beyond the conversations about eschatology and, and got beyond the conversations about liberation theology and started to get married inside. I said, so what are we going to do about eros? What are we going to do about the often discussed conversation about human sexuality and intimacy that we have such a difficult time having in and around church and faith? Not because we aren't constantly talking about it in some way, just constantly, perpetually talking about it. And I don't know your experience, but the way that I was raised is when people said you need to be saved from sin, the first sin that entered into the mind had to be eros. It had to be something that had to do with sexuality and sex. And I might also say that what I found, here's my reality, is that repression leads to obsession. I'm just saying, <laughs> for all the people at home, God bless you. <laughs> Repression leads to obsession. And so I know a great deal about obsession in and around faith. And it was always an oxymoron to me because the people who talked the most about what we ought not do it, you understand, found themselves so deeply engaged in it um, and the activity and the vitality of the closets just, just amazed me coming along as a young person trying to reconcile that. And I suspect it because it happened to me that way. It also happened to some of you. But it seems to be the thing about which we cannot talk, not really have a real conversation. I would go so far as to say that there are people in the room right now and, and online that are very concerned 
about where I'm going with this. <laughs> but I'm going to welcome you on the journey with me because it's such a big deal right now. The conversation about women's bodies and what happens with our bodies. The con conversation about what happens with our children and our young adults. The conversation about sexuality when it is non-binary. The conversations, all of the conversations are very, very much in the marketplace. And so I want to share just a little bit tonight. And then hopefully we'll have some pithy conversation before we leave this room. Um, I also want to marry this to the fact that the sickness of our over-sexualizing and objectifying and commodifying bodies, and particular, particularly black bodies, I'd like to lift up just for a moment. Because there's an inhuman concept in the, in the commodifying and the raping of black bodies that suggested that when black bodies were raped, they were not being raped. They could not be raped if they are not fully human. There's something to be said about a similarity, and I say this because this started happening in this country in 1619, not 1776. From the day, from the beginning, from the start, it was made clear that some of us who are the progeny of ancestors that were brought over here in 1619, and the progeny of ancestors that were brought over over and over and over again, got the percentage of us that is European from being taken and used in many ways to birth children the way that cows and pigs and chickens and such were used to create progeny also. It was a part in some places of actual camps that were created where Women were taken by men, and oftentimes those men were men of European descent. And the babies born were still not privileged. They were just fair-skinned. And I have a long history, and I was able to trace mine all the way back to the Cherokee reservations. And I have some fair-skinned folks. And so when I did my DNA, I found out that I'm part Native American but I'm also a substantial uh, percentage Irish, which I find provocative. So when I did the DNA, I realized or found out that my grandmother, my great-grandmother, was taken by an Irishman in town. And when she was pregnant, he left. When he left, she went back to her husband, because I want to say again, she was taken. She went back to her husband, but she had to deal with the disdain of having a gray-eyed, coal black hair, baby boy with pink feet. That's the way he was described, because of what happened. And so the commodification, or the commodifying of black bodies was a active part of the slave trade, a very active part, not just for proliferating black bodies, but also because we were seriously over-sexualized during that time period. And I, I want to say that because it is, for me, the beginning of what we have to go back to to understand, in some ways, why we are so confused and struggle so much around the conversation of Eros. In some ways, is how it came to us, how it was somehow taught to us how we were forced into situations and demeaned and diminished by having our bodies taken. Taken sexually, taken as animals almost in labor, taken as people who were substandard spiritually, taken by catechisms that said because we were not fully human, certain things that happened to us could not be sinful and before God. And I want to lay that foundation first to sort of give you an understanding of why I think it, it is time for us to talk about Eros and to be having a grown folks conversation about it, right? So let me say this. 
Black bodies. The sickness of over-sexualizing and objectifying black bodies. Women's bodies. The sickness of over-sexualizing and abusing women's bodies. Children's bodies. The sickness of over-sexualizing and abusing children and young adults is an active reality in and around religion. That's not new news to us. We read it in the newspapers, we see it on television. We try to get past the conversation as quickly as we can and move on to something else, just something else, anything else, except to deal with this. But some may wonder, after almost 40 years of pastoring now, why I've chosen to speak openly and publicly about some of the essential aspects of both my experiential, theological, and spiritual evolution regarding human intimacy and sexuality. In the spate of intimacy and sexual orientation related teen suicides has moved me to say something openly about this reality. The failure of conversion and reparative therapy has moved me to speak openly about this reality. The ever-present and often Catholic church closets has moved me to speak openly about this. And it's certainly not just Catholic closets. There's a whole lot I can say about closets. But it has moved me to speak openly about this. The recent television documentaries unveiling sex scandals among the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Amish, and the seemingly inevitable split in the United Methodist Church has moved me to speak openly about human sexuality. If human sexuality can divide one of the largest denominations in the United States and its folks abroad, somehow or other, we've got to begin and or continue to have some conversations about human sexuality. I got that right? And we should not be afraid. Because as soon as we begin to talk about it, we get a little nervous. We hit a tick. Like where, <laughs> which also suggests that we need to have some conversations about human sexuality. We got the Jeffrey Epsteins. We got the Bill Cosbys. We got the Harvey Weinsteins. We got the R. Kellys. And we have the occupant of the White House. And our truth is, all of this negativity and pain suggest that it is time for an open and grown folks, honest, sex and intimacy positive conversation, particularly among people of faith. I use the term sex and intimacy positive conversation or sexual and intimacy orientation as definitions for the practice of eros. If eros was consummated only as a prescribed coital act, it would not be broad enough in its definitions. Essentially, people are held sometimes in an emotional prison that does not consummate in some of the ways in which we can say, well, they had sex, but they are still a prisoner. And it happens over and over again. I might say as an aside, I know people who are convinced that their charismatic leader, their charismatic pastor, charismatic bishop, charismatic evangelist, charismatic theologian really wanted them. And they stayed for years waiting for the day when it would happen. And it never happened. And their lives are passed by. There was just a few crumbs, but enough crumbs, that made them think the possibility was at some point inevitable. And as a theologically progressive people, we often discuss the hideous realities of the way Christianity was and is used for the colonization of any people open to spirit. That's part of why our folks got here. <laughs> they were colonized by people who were open to spirit. We know about the use of the Bible, and particularly the redacted slave Bible, as tools of oppression. We know the rampant, fragile patriarchy that exhibits itself in the diminishment of the gifts of women. We know about that. And we know about the demonizing and vilifying of the LGBTQI++++++ 
community. So as a former fundamentalist Pentecostal, by the way, I still identify, as I said, as an evolving Pentecostal. I am a spirit-filled woman without fear of how that reality or testimony is understood. And in some of my theologically progressive settings, I'm problematic because there's a pejorative assumption attached to my being Pentecostal. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why I talk about it so much. I still speak in tongues. It has not changed. Hallelujah. It is the culture that raised me. And never for the sake of acceptance will I deny the authenticity of my experience. I was, however, raised believing that the eschatology of a suffering people who saw heaven as our only way and the only way out of our brokenness and the only way that we could be healed and the only thing that was our great, es our great equalizer had some difficulty with really seeing clearly what it means to live on earth. Is that all right? This poor eschatology sadly believed we had no responsibility for the planet and that our perpetually pissed off God was coming to destroy this beautiful planet very soon. That was the way we believed it. And as it relates to intimacy and sexuality, I will quote some words sent to me by one of my non-blood Pentecostal siblings, who like me and so many, came into our understanding of human sexuality as a crapshoot. This young gay black man, by the way, he said, we weren't afforded the opportunity to openly date or go to proms or have a boyfriend or a girlfriend in the open, especially if we were in the church. So for a lot of us, we were fast forwarded to sex, underground, behind dirty doors, video booths, church choir rooms, bathrooms, parks shrouded in darkness, not love, not emotional connections, not intimacy, just sex. Because of this, he said, I think some of us became willing to compromise ourselves out of sheer loneliness and a desire to feel desirable. Young men compromised themselves for human contact. Until, he said, as a black gay man, we liberated ourselves from the opinions of the larger black community. Will we ever be truly free? Well, for the sake of our future children, he said, whatever your reality is, come out, come out, wherever you are. It touched me deeply. He sent this to me. And it touched me very deeply. Because it can be transposed, not only from the life of a gay man, but from the life of a number of young women who have also had experiences in heterosexual environments. And I would venture to say that there are young men who have also had experiences in heterosexual environments. I know you probably don't have cougars here, but we have them in California. <laughs> we'll talk more. <clears throat> I was recently speaking both publicly and privately to a group of United Methodist young adults who represent and embody the current struggle in their denomination as being fueled by a disparate understanding of what God and Holy Writ is requiring of Christians. And I said to you today, if you were with us, what this young man said to me, he said, we need to get our ratchet and our righteous together at the same time. He was having some problems with the bipolar Christianity, with the idea that we are one thing publicly and we are another thing privately. Our humanity and our spirituality need to get connected, he said with this urban twist. So in his book, Sapiens, the author Yuval Noah Harari, I love the book Sapiens, by the way, please read it if you have not. He suggests that Homo erectus, our ancestor, was separated and separated us from simians. And Homo erectus learned socialization around fire and food. Community was born out of coming together around human need, warmth and nourishment. And human need, fire and food, was the precursor to villages, towns, cities, countries, kingdoms, and empires. It all began with people getting together for fire and food. 
And we need to come together around some common needs again. And our common need for harmony and spirituality and intimacy requires that they not only be, excuse me, that they not be in conflict with each other, but we need to have this commonality if we're to evolve beyond this present madness. We are in the heat of a current justice war where many are racist, anti-Muslim, anti-Jew, anti-Palestinian, anti-people of color, anti-immigrant, anti-poor, anti-choice, anti-women, anti-environment, anti-LGBTQI, and anti-anything that is not their poor and narrow fundamentalist definition of culture-based religion. And we can ill afford to lose anyone, especially to something so human and so common as a working understanding of human sexuality and intimacy. But there's a big war out there about this. And it's determined to narrowly define intimacy and human sexuality and marriage in a box that many who defend it seldom adhere to. So let me be clear. We are challenged to apply our prima facie first face duty to do no harm to our understanding of human intimacy and human sexuality and sexual expression. Can I say that? Because the garden of God's got a lot of different flowers. Hallelujah. And we need to come up with a way to find an ethic that prepares us for different kinds of situations, even if they are situations we don't fully understand. An ethic, a prima facie duty to do no harm, as it relates to intimate expression. But we also need to come to the conclusion that no more is warranted. Essentially, that expression needs to be added to virtually everything that we do. How we spend our money, how we vote, how we take care of our families, how we take care of the earth. Our first face duty is to do no harm. But what happens when the most harm comes in the name of God? That's complicated, isn't it? How do we find a way to agree to do no harm when harm is done in the name of God? That we weaponizes harm and makes harm okay. It's amazing the things that we have done in the name of God in 1619, taking slaves and making a commodity out of human beings, as long as the patina is the will of God, it is amazing what we can do when we say God is in it. And I think about it often as it relates to war, when people who are opposed to one another, so that Christian mothers and Muslim mothers are praying to God. God by a different name is still God. They are praying to God that their children will come home, and the imams and the priests and the pastors are praying over the armies, that their armies will live and they're going to fight, and they think that the understanding that they have of God will make their army win, and they think that their understanding of God will make their army win, and they're both talking to God and asking God to empower the armies to kill one another in the name of God. Praying to God. And I wonder when I think about it, does God hear the prayer of a Christian mother for her child to come home alive more than God hears the prayer of a Muslim mother? Looking toward the same sky. Talking to her understanding of God. I said, well, we're Christians. I said, well, yes, I'm unapologetically Christian. But the likelihood is that I'm Christian because my mama was a Christian. And my daddy was a Christian. Is that all right? Had I been born in Islamabad, I'd be Muslima. I'd be a Muslim woman. More than likely, I would have been affected by the culture and the religion of the people that I hold dear. And that's our reality. In Dr. Miguel A. De La Torre's book, A Lily Among the Thorns, he suggested we adopt an ethic for human sexuality derived truly from liberation theology, an ethic that demands these things, mutuality, consent, vulnerability, 
and justice. Hmm. Let me say that again. Mutuality, consent, vulnerability, and justice. And it seems that a ethic with these realities that does not include condemnation and fear is very different from the realities that we have experienced in our religious cultures, much of which does not exist, by the way, in a heterosexual marriage bed. Let me say it again. Mutuality, consent, vulnerability, and justice. One more time, I needed to go home with you. <laughs> Mutuality, right. consent, yeah. vulnerability, and justice. Yes. Take that to your marriage bed. It should also be in government. It should also be in religion. It should also be in our understanding of church. It should also be in religious institutions. Because people are married doesn't mean that they are just. It doesn't mean that there is consent. How am I doing with that? It doesn't mean that there's mutual vulnerability. It doesn't mean that there is fairness and kindness. As it relates to human intimacy and sexuality, spirituality is my greatest joy, but sometimes religion my greatest sorrow. If our God view of intimacy begins with fear and condemnation and oppression, we will spend our lives defending these positions, by the way, these negative positions. Even if we cannot live up to them, hmm, we will defend them. I know people who do some dastardly things on Friday and Saturday, and they rush to church on Sunday for cleansing, to be in the company of people who believe everything they did on Friday and Saturday was wrong, and that somehow or other you get a restart, you understand, <laughs> if you go to church for a cleansing. I know people that attend organizations that condemn everything that they are, but they go back anyway because it's a form of penance. I think you hear what I'm saying. Defending these positions, even if we cannot live up to them, or perhaps we will spend our lives in self-hatred, engaging in intimacy while under the cloud of fear and condemnation. And I say this again as a person of African descent, because when things are added, and then more things are added, and then more things are added, pretty soon the weight becomes almost impossible to bear. And if our intimacy and our view, and particularly our intimacy view and our God view begins with a broad, non-fear-based knowledge of human intimacy and human sexuality that includes self-affirmation and respect for others, we will more likely spend lives engaging in intimacy less impacted by fear and condemnation. This is particularly true for people of color, particularly true for people of African descent of color, because there remains in us some vestiges of how we came into this, what happened to us in this country. A raped people, a raped people raped of body, raped of land, raped of citizenship, over and over again, when those raped people want to become strong, sometimes they will then mock the ways of the rapist. And some of the cruelest things that I have seen, I have seen in and among my own people. And I wonder, I say, how is this conceivably possible? But there's such thing as learned behaviors. And when you lift a group of people up and you make them powerful and special, then the next thing that you want to do often is to mock the way that they do what they do, when they do what they do. That's why it's very important right now some of the things that our sons are hearing that are coming from the White House, some of those things will show up in some of their behaviors. Because the reality is, is that the, if the occupant can do that, 
then perhaps that makes it all right for me. They ascribe permission to power. Eros, then, must be liberated. It's got to be liberated from race. It's got to be liberated from power. Eros has got to be liberated from fear. How am I doing with that? We've got to get where we can have grown folks' conversations about Eros, or we will never be able to help our young people to have healthy lives. We don't want our young people to have the struggles that we have had. Nathaniel Toton says this, from patriarchy, racism, dominion, colonialism, and any other form of injustice, Eros must be liberated. The true issue that religion has, even with the LGBTQI community, is the presumption that it feminizes or weakens men, masculinizes or empowers women. And the overwhelming reality of fragile patriarchy is also present, by the way, in the LGBTQI community. Did you know that? And it's not limited to biological men. Now listen, women have disproportionately borne the burden of maintaining sexual purity. Let me say that again. Women have disproportionately borne the burden of maintaining sexual purity until marriage. If you get raped, it's your fault. That was the way we were taught. If you had been where you were supposed to be, if you had done what you were supposed to do, if you had been mindful about sending out those signals, you understand, this would not have happened to you. A conference right now in the United States that is called Make Women Great Again. Did you hear, have you ever heard of this? <laughs> Whose mission is to destroy the feminist establishment. By the way, this is on the web. The conference is called Make Women Great Again. This is a current conference. Whose mission is to destroy the feminist establishment is scheduled for this year in Florida. There's a $2,000 entrance fee it is led by men speakers only. <laughs> only women are invited to attend, however. The conference promo material says women today, quote, women today are being taught to act more like men, unquote. This is on the convention website, which they say has led to divorce, depression, dysfunction, and rampant single motherhood. <laughs> quote, no longer will you have to give in to the toxic bullying, bullying of feminist dogma and go against your biological nature, unquote. Their stated intent is to destroy the feminist establishment. The topics that the men will discuss and teach in these classes are the ills of feminism, the war on motherhood, Beauty and obesity, love and dating, it's on the website, just like this. <laughs> Getting pregnant and having unlimited babies. Getting in shape and beating the competition. And finally, becoming the ultimate wife. $2,000. <laughs> I need to let that sit there just for a minute. $2,000. Emotional, physical, and spiritual abuse often occurs in relationships that have the support of a theologically narrow form of religious and cultural acceptance and affirmation. Religious culture, just like it is dangerous in terms of commodifying black bodies, in terms of commodifying different countries and lands, certain knowledge and culture. Religion is dangerous when it requires uniformity. If you don't take anything else home that I say tonight, the most dangerous reality of this current understanding of religion, and in fact, I would go so far as to say it has probably been the most dangerous reality 
of religion in its history is the demand, the requirement for uniformity in clothing, in understandings of intimacy, in where it can take place. In religion is often and historically dangerous to inclusion and is terrified of what it does not understand and is not accustomed to. What are you people doing? Why are you doing that? That is not how we do it. And sometimes it is a violent reaction. But there are other times when it is more subtle. When in our minds and thoughts we think of one another as substandard. Come on. And we almost have pity. God bless your heart. That's not the way Jesus would have us baptized. God bless your little heart. That's not the way that the music should be in worship. God bless your heart. You all are just too loud. God bless your heart. And we'll get together for the annual interfaith service where we only have to suffer for about an hour and a half putting up with those people who don't have the heart of God in the ways in which we have the heart of God. Intimacy and uninformed human sexuality is also one of those realities around which we disagree. And it is true. Let me just make an aside. One of the things that always caught my attention is when I see a group of religious people together and I wonder who they are, I always look at the women. Because the women usually carry the responsibility Come on now. To let people know who we are. I see a group of people, I say, oh, they're Muslims. See a group of people, I say, they're Baptists, trust me. They're not just, <laughs> they're not just Baptists, they're uptown Baptists. Not to be confused with regular Baptists. Or I look at a group of women and I say, oh, they are Pentecostals, oneness Pentecostals. Oh, you'd have to know. I look at a group of women, I say, they are Trinitarian Pentecostals. Why? How do I know? Because of the way in which women are burdened to wear the clothing, come on, that differentiates one group from, they are Muslims, they are Muslims. I can look at them and tell who they are. The responsibility tends to fall to the women, right? Most of us who were introduced to intimacy in culturally religious environments were introduced poorly. You don't have to say amen. I know we were introduced poorly, particularly if we were part of a religious community or a family that was under threat by religion to conform and to perform according to the understandings of our faith group. An intimacy uninformed person, an intimacy uninformed train out of the station can be both dangerous and vulnerable. Yet we don't really have a mechanism to help people to understand that conversation just really doesn't happen in many of our circles. The only conversation is don't until you do. Let me do that again. Don't until you do. And when you do, you shouldn't have. That was good what I said. You shouldn't have. It's very confusing for young people. It was confusing for us. I remember when I married. I married according to what the church told me to do. And I remember, can I tell the truth? Yeah. I remember when I got married, and I remember the first night after the wedding, and I remember waking up in the morning saying, are you serious? <laughs> you have got to be kidding me. All of my young adult life, really honestly, I waited all this time for this. What's wrong? I must have missed something. I took a wrong turn. Come on now. Now, something happened. And it's over. We're done. Everything's finished. Thanks. You want to say thanks? I don't have anything to rejoice in. <laughs> if you know, you know. I would ask for a show of hands, but I will not do that to you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because nobody talked to us about it. You just fell into it, and you tried to get it together. We weren't even encouraged to read about it. 
to study about it. There were no people in our tribe that talked us through it. It was a complete crapshoot. And you all understand exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody in here knows what I mean. That's all right. I'll get a show of hands later on. But let me wrap this up. Affectional, intimate, sexual, same or opposite of multiple gender choice orientations were certainly not discussed. It was binary, and that's it, and that's all. You know, there are five sexes, and we still talk binary. So let me just say, five sexes, that include male, female, hermaphrodite, who are born with both genitalia. And you wonder sometimes on the conversation of sin, where is their sin? How do they even know when they have sin? There are female pseudo-hermaphrodites, individuals who have ovaries and some male genitalia but lack testes. Male pseudo-hermaphrodites, individuals who have testes and some female genitalia but lack ovaries. Was this conversation, by the way, was way outside of our ability at an evening dinner talk to discuss because we were taught that there was a binary. How am I doing with that? Of course, this would have begged the question, why are we stuck on two sexes only? Why can't we imagine that we can be just as diverse as human beings as the rest of creation? Why are we stuck on the realities of binary when in reality, we are so different. And not just in terms of these kinds of realities, in terms of how we live culturally. In my church and cultural experience, I have seen relational and sexual dynamics that also suggest non-binary relational realities among the alleged binary. Uh-oh. I know, I've seen strong women with very compliant men I call them honeydew husbands. I love them. Honey do this and honey do that. And, and honey just loves doing it. Do you understand? That doesn't fit the stereotype, does it? I've seen hetero women who enjoy the company of manly women, even though they have a husband. And it doesn't always live itself out sexually. I know partners who are considered, can I just tell the truth? top or dominant in life who are happily submissive in their personal lives. I know private intimacy, people who have real racist problems with people of color in public, but choose to be involved with people of color in their intimacy. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? But it's a part. So people who enjoy cleansing theologies, in an environment that condemns them. It's almost titillating. I call it theological masochism. Beat me, make me write bad checks. Many who stay in these environments don't feel that they are oppressive. Why? Because they actually find secrets and closets titillating. Can I tell the truth? They would rather be in an environment that is theologically oppressive because that creates an opportunity for closets. And closets are more titillating than telling your truth openly. Oh, you don't know, you don't know. But I know. Because of the experience that I've had watching this reality. Over and counseling people who are trying to reconcile their human sexuality with their understanding of the divine. And this among the greatest mysteries, what I call out-of-body intimacy, where the more super-religious are so super-religious when they're standing up, and the most scandalous when they're laying down. I begin to watch the idea of thou, must, thou doth protest too much. When people protest and protest, and protest and condemn and condemn and protest about what other people's intimacy involves. I think to myself, and if we follow you, we will likely find out that something very complicated is happening or has happened in your life. So where do these narrow and skewed and often cyclically dangerous 
practice is coming from. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychotherapist. But I'm a pastor for almost 40 years who has experienced exile myself. And I've been sent to communities most marginalized because I have been exiled in many ways from the church that raised me. 40 years of work, well, 35 years of work around HIV. And I can say to you, I know what exile is like, but I also know what it is to build a community in exile from people who were thrown away and cast out and forgotten. I know what it is. I have on the altar in my office a whole level of that altar are different. It, it, it moves me. Different vases and holders for ashes. And these are the ashes of the people whose parents did not want them. And they came to us, and they died among us. And I didn't have any directive about how they wanted their ashes scattered, so we kept them. But I had no idea that the ashes level on the altar in my office would grow to the extent that it has. Why do I say that? Because I think it gives me the necessary credibility to speak to what I know can happen to people destructively when we are narrow in our understanding of what the body of God and the body of Christ really is in the earth, and that we narrow it down to our own lived experience. Marginalized. I know what it is to be marginalized. I know what it is to be exiled. But I know also what it is to build something significant in exile such that now when people have children, they have young people, and they don't know how to talk to them about stuff, guess what they do? They call me. <laughs> Say, I need you to talk to my son. I need you to talk to my daughter. I need you to talk. I need you to talk to them because we're very concerned, very concerned. And I, like many, am in recovery from bad theology and the theological culture that was spawned by it not just for my ancestors, but from the Apostle Paul's too. I'm concerned about his theology. Can I just say for a minute? Yes. He had issues with his flesh. And his issues became our issues. Christianity quotes him more than we quote anyone. And remember, Jesus didn't write anything. Paul did the writing, and some other folks did the writing, but he wrote most of it. And we quote him all the time, but we are often not able to understand his anguish. And I say that because now when I read him, I read the writings of a young man who was having some real difficulty reconciling his love for himself and his love for God. We simply don't respect the limited opportunity for expansive thought, by the way when we read him sometime. And we have allowed growth in every other area, but I think I was able to watch Paul grow. I like how he was when he got to Galatia. How am I doing with that? Yeah. I like how he was. Hallelujah. It is for freedom that Christ has made us free. <laughs> you know, in Christ we are neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. There's something happened, but chronologically, he was way down the line. But we read him in his first struggles as though that's where he was all of his life, and that's where we all have to be. What was this self-hatred? I hate myself. I despise myself. And I was reading him one day, and I said, let me tell you something, Paul. I'm almost 65 years old. It took me my whole life to learn to love myself properly. I'm telling you straight out, I don't care what you said. I'm not buying into self-hatred no matter what. It is not going to happen to me. <laughs> self-hatred is contagious. It is vile, and it is problematic. Come on now. Because when you self-hate, you have to find somebody less than you for you to feel good about yourself. I said, nope, Paul, I, if you had been a member of my church, I would have sent you for counseling. <laughs> I'm going to end with this. I am in recovery, my beloved. 
from the sin of self-hatred and self-loathing. And I'm in a community of people that I spend an enormous amount of time helping them to love themselves, to affirm themselves and to be their best and highest selves. Because they are black, many of them, because they are Latinx, many of them because they are LGBT, many of them because they are transgender, many of them, many of them. Because they are broken and they are sad and they've been broken by religion, many of them. And I spend my time with them because I know that road. I understand that path. I'm in recovery from the sin of absolutism that suggests that the Bible was ever, ever intended to be a safe box that is going to handle all of life's questions. Hmm. And the truth is, if it does not, for people who are biblical literalists among us, they will find something as close to what they want to say in there as possible. They will already decide what they want the Bible to say and then find something in the Bible that says it. I also call this the sin of lazy colonized theology. LCT trifling is what I call it. <laughs> lazy colonized theology. And there are virtually very few examples of broad understandings of human sexuality in the Bible. You're not going to find broad understandings of human sexuality in the Bible. You're not going to find broad understandings of human sexuality in the Bible teaching. It's simply just not there. Because the understanding of that time would not have been able to understand some of the things that we understand. But the internet is not there either. Right. And everybody's on it. It's not there. You can't find it. It is not there. But we don't get mad at the book and close it up and go away because the Internet is not there. How then could we possibly have expected that all of the nuancing of human intimacy and sexuality would be there? It's just not there. But instead of choosing to expect and accept an evolution, an evolution in human communication, I am a child of reel-to-reel -reel tapes. I remember that, and I remember eight tracks, and I remember cassettes. I remember records that were 78, 45, and 33. I remember, and now everything is digitized and on my phone. I came a long way, baby. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that if that could evolve, why can't we evolve around conversations as people of faith around something that is so real and so human and so common among us. Why can't we talk about intimacy without fear and without condemnation and without guilt? We fear, and that is very sad to me. And this is the one that I think, which is in my, my last little paragraph right here, before we have our conversation. I preach a sermon called Someone Has Stolen Jesus that focuses on the disappointment of those who return to Jesus' tomb only to find him gone. They loved him, but they did not believe that he was gone because something miraculous had happened. He is, he, they didn't believe that he has risen part. So they asked everybody, where have you taken him? Who has stolen his body? Am I accurate? I have a similar question about Jesus and Eros. For those that declare that Jesus was very human, if he was very human, where was the Eros in his life? Why couldn't he have had this most basic human experience and expression? He got angry. He loved his mother. He ate and drank wine. I know you don't want it. I want you, you want it to be grape juice. It was not. I know that's what you want. It was wine. How am I doing with that? It was wine. Because everybody said that he and his crowd were wine bibbers. Come on now. It was his, come on. It was wine. He cared for the disadvantaged. He loved children. He spoke truth to power. He was taken and killed by religion and empire. Why didn't he have intimacy? Why couldn't he have intimacy? 
Why is the thought of him having intimacy something that almost scares us to death? And then so how does that live in us? How will we uh, approach it? How do we feel about it if it was so horrible that this holy one, though he was fully human, it was kept from him? How do we feel about it? I'll tell you how we felt about it. They told me when I was a child coming along, my mind belongs to God. Hallelujah. My mouth speaks forth the things of God. My heart belongs to God. Out of my belly flows rivers of living water. And then we skip down. My knees <laughs> bow before God. My feet walk before God. And then we come back and say, my whole body belongs to God. I said, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about the things between your navel and your knees? Didn't God make those things? And if I am made by the hand of God and I am altogether beautiful, then that part is altogether beautiful also. Everything I have is good. Huh? All my stuff. I need you to hear me what I'm saying. God made all my stuff and all my stuff is good stuff. There are not things that should be left out and called profane because it is, they are just important, as important as the rest of my stuff. God didn't cut me up in pieces like that and say part of me is not holy, not right, not love, not fashion. Come on, talk to me. By the hand of God. And it was calling those things profane that made the writers, the historians, keep that reality from even being a possibility in the life of Jesus. And anyone who does not have something happening with our reality of human intimacy is not fully human. Stop saying it if you don't believe it. Not fully human. The ministry of Jesus was to show us how to reconcile our humanity to God, not to make our humanity deficient. Hallelujah. 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 If Jesus was not fully human, how can we follow his example? Fully human. Buddha had a wife. Muhammad had 13 wives. <laughs> Jesus experienced storge, the love that is empathy. Jesus experienced phileos. The friend love. Jesus experienced agape, the unconditional love. Why could not he have experienced eros, the romantic love? I want to say, and I want to say openly and honestly, that it is time for us to move into a place where grown folks ought to be to talk about human sexuality. Why do we have to do it, Bishop Flunder? Because our children need us. Our young people need a better response because our children are vulnerable. And the reason that some of them are taken is because they don't know what is about to happen until it happens because they have not been taught. And our children are suffering from condemnation and guilt because something has already happened and they are afraid to tell us. We are the ones who have to grow up and we have to find a theology that makes beautiful our whole creation, that honors our whole creation. We have to grab an ethic that is the ethic that says do no harm. Why? Because the ethic that, has do, that says do no harm is portable from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. That is our challenge. Why is it such an important challenge? because it's being talked about everywhere. And because there is a precedent being set in the leadership of this country that somehow suggests that some people are intimacy expendable, we will have to teach the children something better. God bless you is my prayer. Hi, um, I'm Casey. Uh, Hi, Casey. Uh, first year I'm Deb in here at School of Theology. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about um, 
like a whole idea of Jesus mm-hmm. being uh, not in an intimacy mm-hmm. and the fully human. Mm-hmm. Like that is a good point, and because there's this whole phenomenon of I don't know stories or myths uh, mm-hmm. that Jesus did have a wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like the Vinci Code, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, I was just. That is my comment about it, you know. It's like, yes. Yeah, I always wonder, is it true or not? Yeah. Uh, but it's just fascinating watching um, people comment saying, no, it's not true, because that's that's a whole fear based. Mm-hmm. So thank you it for is. making that point. I thank you for it, lifting up the Da Vinci Code type realities that are out there. Because it begs the question when people answer <coughs> rapidly, oh, no. That's impossible. And there's, my question is, what is it that makes us so frustrated by the possibility? What is it about the possibility that makes it so frustrating for us? You understand what I mean? And does that suggest that intimacy, somehow or other, has a certain evil attached to it that we can never ascribe to Jesus? Which I think is really quite something for human beings. <laughs> that what does that sound like? What does that mean? And, and it is a clear picture of how we really feel about human intimacy, right? Or how we've been made to feel about human intimacy. Anybody else? There, there are so many years of Jesus' life that we are not told anything about, Absolutely. including his teenage years. Yeah. And he was able to withstand the temptations from Satan. Yes. He must have learned about temptation somewhere. Yes. Yes. You make a good point. Who in the world is it that shows up as a baby, comes back around 13 at the temple, comes back around 30, and you get nothing else? Is it redacted? <laughs> what, what is it that happened? And what is it about his humanity that had to be kept secret? And I don't suggest that it was anything, you know, vile or things along those, uh, what, what we would consider vile. No, that's not even good. Anything that was truly vile would be a better way to say it. But who, who lives a life like that? Who, whose life doesn't have this? And in some of the passages, for instance, when he went back to Nazareth and you got a, an idea, when they would not receive him, he wasn't able to heal people in the city that he came from. Because when he came in, they said, well, aren't you Joseph and Mary's son? Then they called the name of his brothers, aren't you? They called the name of his four brothers and sisters. The sisters didn't get any names, of course, but the brothers did get names, right? And it gave us a view on the fact that he was born somewhere and raised somewhere and in a family. It also gave us the view that Mary had some more kids. That's right. Which is a passage that we skip over all the time that because the question is, with who? And what was that about? We haven't got that part figured out. But I think, that, I think the part that is true is that he was not able to do certain things that he powerfully did in other places among the people that saw his humanity or knew his humanity, which seems to be a theme that in order to, for you to do miraculous things, somehow or other your humanity has to be taken from you. That's very problematic for me because I think that our humanity is the locus of our power, our presence, and it is the thing that connects us. I can objectify you forever, brother. I can say, you know how white men are. I mean, they get way back over here. <laughs> you know how they are. All of them, they're just like that. You know white men, so I'm going to stay over here because that's the way white men are, and I can just stay like that. Now, if I, don't, don't let me scare you. If I come to you, come on with me. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. You're going to be all right. Okay. <laughs> and I touch you, and your humanity and my humanity touches. The first thing that I feel is I can feel your heart beat, and you can feel mine. Mm-hmm. And that's the locus of our connection, even our brief connection. I'm sorry, you can sit down. All right, you can, you can sit down. I'm not going to put you through that. So. But what happens is our humanity is a part of our divinity. 
two times in the text that the voice of God said, this is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. One is John's baptism, right? Jesus in his underwear. That's the way I, I look at it. <laughs> the other was on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was his most radiant self. In the water in his underwear with his cousin on the Mount of Transfiguration, and God says the same thing. I am well pleased. This is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. I believe God honors our humanity in the same way that God honors our divinity. We got to do something about the fact that we have made wicked our humanity and act like and we act like we're walking around here in divinity. I'm saying this to you. Your humanity is loved and known by God. All of your humanity is loved, embraced, and known by God. We don't have to lie. We don't have to live a lie. We don't have to present a lie. You can bring your whole package, and your whole self is known and loved by God. Yes. Thank you for taking the time. God bless.